Well, good morning, Northwest Chapel. My name is Noah Carpenter, and I am the director of our children and young adult ministries here at the church, and it is a blessing to share from God's Word with you all this morning. Uh, Now, this has been my church home for just about all my life, and it's been such a blessing to just witness all that God has done here and all that He is doing here. Uh, Now, in my role here at the church, I work with young adults, children, and I serve with the youth group. Uh, So if there's anyone that is around the age of 30 or younger, we're bound to cross paths at some point. Uh, But something I have discovered uh, while working with those that are younger than me, whether high schoolers or children, uh, is that they're very honest with their opinions about you. (laughs) Uh, It's been great for me to learn uh, what kind of haircuts work for me and what don't, uh, whether glasses suit my face or not, and so you can see I'm not wearing any, Um, and just a whole other host of discoveries. Uh, But besides that, the church has blessed me over the last three years uh, to take one seminary course a semester, and it's just been such a fun and rich way for me to really just dive into Scripture and learn about our awesome, awesome God. Uh, And so before uh, I begin today, I just ask you to bow your heads and join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning, God. Uh, We just pray for your presence here, Lord. We just pray that as we go into your word and learn more about you, God, uh, that you would just be present, um, that you would reveal more of yourself and your character, God, um, that we'd be reminded of Jesus and the gospel, um, and that we would worship you here this morning. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Now, as we end the year and head into the next, I thought it would be good to talk about the topic of faith, something foundational to all Christ followers. And so as you're sitting there, I just want you to take a brief moment and think about how would you define faith. Uh, It's so often we use these words without really meditating on what they mean or look like. Now, the words faith and trust uh, are very similar in meaning and are often used interchangeably. Really, the biggest difference between the two is how they're used grammatically. So at its core, faith looks like trust. In Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is defined as the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. And so in other words, faith involves trusting something that you can't explicitly see or prove. Now, our faith as Christians is the confidence that God can and will do what he says in his word. Now, faith is also the means by which we're saved, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Now, the scriptures also make clear that faith without trust is not really faith at all. Uh, our faith must be an active one, or we risk just having beliefs. And there's many that know all about Jesus, but they fail to trust their lives to him. Now, an active faith is a faith that dictates our actions. Jesus' very own brother writes about this in James 2, that we prove our faith by our obedience to Christ. And if a pattern of obedience is not found, that should be a gauge for us to evaluate our faith. Now, a passage I've selected for us today is what Miss Kira read for us, Matthew 14, where Jesus walks on water. And I've selected this passage because it really dives into and explores this topic of faith and what it looks like to trust Christ alone. And so I'll be walking through the scriptures, and afterwards there'll be some application or takeaway points um, that will follow along with the bulletin insert. Uh, But before we dive in, I just wanted to give a few points of context for where we will be. Now, with the book of Matthew, the overarching theme that we see uh, is serves, rather, to show Jesus as the Messiah. And this is the one that is the prophesied fulfillment of the promised king that will bring peace and deliverance. 
The portion we'll be looking at specifically today uh, takes this theme of clarifying Christ's identity as the Messiah, uh, but specifically to the disciples. Now, before the passage we'll be in this morning, uh, Jesus had been facing growing opposition in his ministry. And since he knew it was not yet time for his betrayal and death, he fled from where he was in Galilee. And upon hearing about the execution of his friend and cousin, John the Baptist, Jesus goes to seek solitude on a hillside next to the Sea of Galilee. This is where he goes and performs the miracle of feeding the 5,000 with just five loaves of bread and two fish. And where we will be picking up in the word today is the same day that that miracle happens. And so if you have your Bibles, you can open them and turn with me to Matthew 14, and we will be starting in verse 22. And so Scripture says, Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. Now, there's another account of this story in the book of John, and in that, it shows that after Jesus feeds this crowd, they wanted to take him by force and make him their king. They recognized Jesus' miracle as a sign that he was this prophetic fulfillment of the promised king. However, the vast majority were not heralding Jesus as king because they recognized their need for God. Rather, they responded to the spectacle of his miracle and their hope that he would bring them deliverance from their Roman oppression. This was further evidenced by after this, uh, these, this crowd of people follows Jesus across the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus rebukes them for desiring his miracles over him as Savior. Now, it can be easy for us to point fingers at these people for not recognizing Jesus as God or wanting what he can provide more than himself. But I think this is a common trap that even we as Christians can fall into. So often we get caught up in wanting these grand spiritual marvels or stories that we forget to bask in the greatest miracle that ever happened. That being God coming to this earth and providing a way through Jesus where we can have eternal life, where we can have an eternal relationship with our Creator. And someone deciding to pray and cry out to God or opening their Bible to spend time with God or sharing their faith is just as spiritually significant when we think about who we are apart from Christ. Now, we can also fall into the trap of seeking God's hand over his face. Now, what this means is that we can often desire God, or sorry, what God gives us rather than himself. This is often manifested in the way that we pray. How often do we pray for things that, if answered, would make us less dependent on God? It's not a bad thing to go to God and make requests. In fact, Jesus himself tells us to do that. But God wants our hearts. He wants to be at the center of our thoughts, our actions, our decisions, our motives, because he wants a relationship with us. And we must guard our hearts to not value his blessings over a relationship with him. Now, in the story by the time the crowd was fed, Jesus told his disciples to continue on to their destination as he would spend time in solitude. Now, solitude is a spiritual discipline that we see demonstrated by Jesus and throughout Scripture, and it's essentially spending time dedicated to God alone. This can include prayer, meditating on God's Word, or just simply enjoying God's presence. Uh, Now, as we go back into the text, Verse 24 says, And the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. So Jesus is on the hillside in solitude with God, and the disciples are out at sea. 
The journey of the disciples was about five miles. It was across the northern tip of the lake from Bethesda to Gennesaret. And because they were fighting winds that opposed them, they likely had to row to their destination. You can imagine not only (laughs) rowing for that long, but against winds, but also being tossed by these huge waves. The disciples had already experienced a life-threatening storm back in Matthew chapter 8 that was put to rest by Jesus, but here they're by themselves. The text says that they were a considerable distance from land, so they were likely a little over halfway into their five-mile journey at this point. As we go back to the text, verse 25 says, Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. Now, in the Roman world, the night was divided into four watches. These were each three hours long from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. And the fourth watch would have been the darkest part of the night, somewhere between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. Now, at this point, The disciples had been battling the storm for over nine hours. For me, all I really want to do for nine hours is sleep. Um, But put yourself in the disciples' shoes. It had been a long day of feeding the crowd. They had been in this boat for nine hours, getting tossed by huge waves and a storming sea. And now in the darkest part of the night, they see this figure walking towards them. They had little reason to believe or expect that something or someone walking on water was even possible. I mean, up to this point, while they had seen Jesus perform miracles, they were still immature in their faith. And so they were terrified, and they cried out in fear. Uh, We go back to uh, verse 27. It says, "But But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. We see Jesus, their compassionate and patient teacher, offer them three statements of encouragement. He says, take courage. The idea of standing in boldness and confidence. He says, it is I, which recalls Yahweh's voice back in Exodus with the burning bush. This is a statement of Jesus declaring his deity. And he says, do not be afraid. And as a general rule, when when God says something, like Jesus here, it's important. All right, as we continue on in verse 28, it says, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on water, and came towards Jesus. Essentially, here we're seeing Peter test the identity of this figure, this person walking on water, to see if it really is Jesus. While this might seem like a weird way to test Jesus, we have to remember that at this point, Peter and the other disciples had already seen, uh, or sorry, had already performed some of the same miracles as Jesus. Now, we also see Peter take initiative beyond the other disciples. This would have been characteristic of him, as we see elsewhere in Scripture, because Peter was often had an impulsive enthusiasm. But as Peter prepares his way onto the water, he demonstrates three things. He shows that he's starting to really be convinced that this figure is Jesus. He's showing faith in God's power, and he's showing enthusiasm to participate with Jesus. Now, this is important because this is somewhat of what our faith should look like. When God calls us to something, we should have confidence in him to obey with an eager enthusiasm. We should be excited to be a part of what God is doing in this world. Now, we also see that Jesus grants Peter's request. And like Peter, Jesus defies the laws of nature and walks on water. Something that would have been thought as impossible is made possible with the power of Christ. While Peter is often commended for his faith in Jesus at this point in the passage, we still have to remember that this was still just a baby step in Peter's faith. 
And like a good parent, Jesus allows Peter to walk on water as an opportunity to nurture Peter's faith. Elsewhere in the book of Matthew, we kind of see the flip side of what's happening here. And the Pharisees ask Jesus to perform a sign, but Jesus refuses. This is because Jesus did not come to perform, to create faith where none existed. Rather, Jesus came to nurture faith where it would grow. Just like a seed needs care and nurture to grow into a plant, God meets us in our needs and he gives us opportunities to grow and trust him. As we continue on in verse 30, it says, but when they saw the or sorry, but when he saw the wind, speaking of Peter, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, "Lord, save me." Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. "You have little faith," he said. "Why did you doubt?" The enthusiast Peter gets out of the boat at Jesus' command and does something that no person in history has ever done before and walks on water. But at some point, between leaving the boat and making his way towards Jesus, human doubt creeps into Peter's mind. Peter sees his surroundings, this violent storm in the raging waters, and his fear overtakes his faith. Now, don't be mistaken, it was Peter's total confidence in Jesus that allows him to walk on water, but when fear replaced his confidence, he began to sink. The fear that we feel towards anything that seems bigger than the Lord is often a sign of where our faith is lacking. Where we find fear in our lives is where we find areas that need to be brought before the Lord. Now, fear is not always a bad thing. Uh, The scripture tells us that we must have a healthy fear of the holy and perfect Lord. That the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom and leads to understanding. But there's another type of fear that the scriptures talk about that Paul writes about in 2 Timothy, and he calls this a spirit of fear. If I've learned anything in my 25 years in this world, it's that it's easy to fear. I can easily fear hard conversations or things happening to the people I love or the future or even what this world will look like in 10 years. And these types of fear are overcome, though, with faith and trust in our Heavenly Father. Uh, in 1 John 4.18, it says, There's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made in perfect love. As Christians, we don't have to have a spirit of fear because we don't have to fear the punishment of our sins. Christ took our punishment, and as Christians, we replace our fear by rejoicing in our forgiveness. So in times that we're overcome by fear, we need to remember who we are in Christ. Now back to the story, in Peter's terror, we see him turn his attention back to God as he says, Lord, save me. We see then the Messiah answer Peter's cry immediately by reaching out and grabbing him. Now, I can't even imagine what that would have looked like of just Jesus commanding the waters in such a way where he can firmly plant himself to pull up Peter. It's incredible. Now, some might expect Peter, or sorry, some might expect Jesus to praise Peter at this point for his display of faith that allows him to walk on water. That's not what happens. Jesus used every moment to teach his disciples. Every conversation, every demonstration. It was all to develop the the, the people that would be the foundational leaders of his church. And Jesus says to Peter, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Here Jesus isn't addressing Peter's faith. 
I mean, we see Peter show more faith than the other disciples, but he's addressing Peter's doubt. I'm personally impressed with Peter's faith that allows him to walk on water, uh, but Jesus is more concerned about what stopped Peter from continuing to trust in him. I think about moments in my own life where I've experienced God in the most real and tangible ways, yet doubt that gives life to fear creeps in and my my trust wavers. Jesus was trying to make something clear to Peter. A faith in him can make the impossible made possible. But that fear kills faith. We must not let fear overtake our confidence in God. Now, as we continue on in these last two verses, 32, it says, And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. And then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now, in this passage, we see miracle after miracle And as soon as Jesus and Peter get back into the boat, the storm stops immediately and peace is restored. Now these miracles, Jesus walking on water, Peter walking on water, the storm stopping, they all served to show to the disciples who Jesus is. Now before this, in Matthew 10, the disciples were at sea with Jesus and there was a storm that was so violent that they feared for their lives. As Jesus was sleeping. When Jesus woke up, he rebukes the wind and the seas, and there were suddenly calm waters. Now, when this happened, the disciples turned to each other and they asked, Who is this man? Who is Jesus? And now, here in Matthew 14, we see a shift in the disciples when Jesus and Peter get back into the boat, and they no longer wonder who Jesus is, but they worship him as the Son of God. Of God. Now, this is where we'll look at a few takeaways from this passage. You can take notes in the bulletin insert if you want. Um, But the first thing that we can take away is that trusting God requires knowing God. In our passage, we see Jesus himself prioritized personal time with God. Jesus was the only man to ever live a perfect life, and in his perfection, he modeled for us how to live. He went up to the hillside, and he sent the disciples on their way so that he could be alone with God. Jesus was likely also preparing for his ministry to the Gentile regions on the other side of the Sea of Galilee where they would be. But what does this mean for us? Well, it's like any other relationship that we can have, and that to know someone, you have to spend time with them. You might be wondering, well, how do we spend time with God, our creator? One of the best ways that we can spend time and know God is by what he's revealed about himself through scripture. In scripture, God shows us his character. He shows us his promises, his will, And we see how he's been working throughout history. Scripture is also how we know that God is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. We can also know God through other ways, such as prayer and spending time in fellowship with other believers and worshiping and by walking in the Spirit. But we should not take for granted the awesomeness of God's revelation that is his holy Bible. We can trust God this new year by dedicating time to know him through his word. Now another takeaway that we can have is that trusting God requires the acknowledgement of his lordship. Jesus demonstrates that he is Lord over creation by manipulating the laws of nature to do the impossible. He provides food for thousands of people from just five loaves of bread and two fish. He walked on water and he allows Peter to do the same. And he calmed the violent storm and the raging waters 
in an instant. All right, remind you that one of Matthew's purposes in writing this book was to show the Jews that Jesus is God and that he's Lord over creation. Now for us to acknowledge Jesus' lordship is for us to recognize that Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. For us to acknowledge Jesus' lordship is for us to recognize Jesus' authority and power in our own lives. In the New Testament, Jesus, uh, after his resurrection, uh, the title of Lord was applied to his name as a sign of respect, but also to declare that Jesus is God. Now, the beauty of the gospel is that in all his authority and power, Jesus came to this world to humble himself and serve us. Acknowledging his lordship is a commitment to obeying him. In Luke 6, 46, Jesus says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Jesus is more than the Messiah. He's more than the Savior. He's Lord of all, whether people recognize it or not. And we can trust God this new year by acknowledging his lordship and obeying him. Now, another takeaway that we can take uh, from this passage is that trusting God requires looking to him over our circumstances. As Peter walks on the water towards Jesus, he's overcome by his surroundings and he starts to sink. But he's reminded of Jesus and he calls out to him for help. When we place our faith in Jesus over the fear of our circumstances, We demonstrate our dependence on him. God loves our cry for help because he knows that we can't save ourselves. The challenge becomes for us to realize that we can't save ourselves. We must realize that we're not capable and that he is God and we are not. The Lord wants us to depend on him because he knows that he is the greatest provider there is. Scripture makes it clear that we must uh, depend on God for many things, including our salvation, for wisdom, and really everything. While it can be painful to come to the end of ourselves, like Peter sinking in the water, it can be the greatest blessing when it turns our attention back on to God. We can trust God this new year by looking to him alone for all our needs. Now, the last takeaway I have for us this morning is that trusting God requires faith in Jesus. As Jesus and Peter get back into the boat, Jesus calms the storm, and for the first time, the disciples worship him as the Son of God. The beginning of our time together, uh, I talked about what an active faith looks like. I define faith as pl- placing your trust in something and that a true faith dictates our actions. To have faith in Jesus is to trust Jesus as your Savior. In Romans 3, uh, verses 22 through 23, It says, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now this passage tells us the bad news and the good news. The bad news is that we are sinful. And because our sin, we're destined to be separated from our Heavenly Father for all of eternity. And the more you know and understand how gracious and compassionate our God is, the worse this news becomes. But the good news is that God loves us. And because of that, he made a way for us to be righteous through faith where we could have a relationship with him and no longer suffer the consequences of our sin. There is no other way except by grace through faith in Christ. 
And just like the impossible being made possible, as Jesus and Peter walk on water, he made the impossible possible by dying on the cross and taking the punishment that we deserved so that if we trust in him, we can have eternal life. We can trust God this new year by trusting Jesus with our lives and letting him transform us to look more like him because that is what faith in him does. Now I'll close here with a story. For those of you that don't know, I went to the Ohio State University and I graduated from there. And might I add, many years ago, because I know some of you still mistaken me for a high schooler. <laughs> um, <laughs> But during my time there, me and my friends would always get season tickets to the OSU football games. Now, with each progressive year, our seniority would move our seats closer and closer to the field. Um, And another special treat of the OSU football games uh, was seeing the band during the halftime show. The OSU band is very renowned and known for putting on a wonderful show with all sorts of moving images created by the individual musicians. And the problem, though, with each progressive year getting closer and closer to the field was that these images got more difficult to see and make out. On the ground level, for me, it looked like utter dysfunction. It looked like individual musicians were about to run into each other and crash their instruments at any and every point. But when I would look back at the jumbo screen, I could see a clear picture of what they were doing, which barely resembled the dysfunction I saw at my level. Now, I share this because oftentimes we can't see what God is doing. And while we may not always be able to see it, we can trust that God is sovereign, that he's in control, and that he's orchestrating everything in a way according to his will. Our God is at work in the details. He's a God that makes everything beautiful in its time. And as you head into this new year, I urge you to reflect on your relationship with God. To have faith in Jesus is to trust him. And the good news is that he is worthy of our trust. Imagine all the incredible things that God can do in your life this year, if you trust him, simply, fully, and without reservation. Now, I ask you just to bow your heads with me as I pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for who you are. God, just more and more as we see your character in Scripture, I'm just personally reminded of how beautiful you are and your grace is, God that I am sinful and that I need saving from myself, Lord, and you provided a way when there was no way, God. You made the impossible possible like walking on water, God. And so I thank you for just the salvation that you bring. I just pray for this upcoming year, God, that we really can reflect on who we are in you, God, in our relationship with you, and that you would continue to mold I and everyone here to look more like the image of your son, Jesus, God. Thank you for this morning where we can worship you freely. And it's in your name that I pray. Amen.